Okay, so it's uh, my, my great pleasure to introduce the F.A. Hayek Memorial Lecture, sponsored by the estate of Stephen Hogg. Uh, the, the speaker is the eminent Paul H. Rubin, who is the um, Samuel Candler Dobbs Professor of Economics at Emory University, past president of the Southern Economic Association, and former editor of Managerial and Decision Economics. He is associated with the Technology Policy Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, and the Independent Institute. Dr. Rubin has been a senior fellow at President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors and has held senior positions at the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission and the Federal Trade Commission. He has taught economics at Emory, the University of Georgia, University of York, VPI, uh, University of New York, excuse me, a VPI, and George Washington University Law School. Dr. Ru Rubin has written or edited 11 books and published over 250 articles and chapters on economics, law, regulation, and evolution in professional journals. He frequently contributes to the Wall Street Journal and consults on the uh, economics of legal issues. Dr. Rubin received his BA from the University of Cincinnati in 1963 and his PhD from Purdue University in 1970. Uh, the topic that he'll be addressing us on is how we talk about economics and why it matters. And I want to hear this. <laughs> Dr. Rubin. Thank you, Joe, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I'm glad to be here. I'm particularly happy to do the Hayek lecture. Anyone would be proud to do a Hayek lecture, but um, in particular, uh, Hayek was an early pioneer in many, of course, in huge numbers of things, but he was also one of the few scholars of his generation to understand that our evolved preferences, our evolved behaviors, our, our minds evolves in ways that affect uh, our decision making today. Um, he was writing in the era of what's been called the standard social science model, or what Pinker has called the era of the blank slate, when social scientists thought the humans were born as blank slates and they can learn anything and behave in any way. And Hayek was, was one of the first um, earliest people to realize that that was not, was not true. I have a quote there, uh, which is really the basis of much of what, what I'm going to say, um, that our minds were adapted to a very different environment than the one in which we now live, and that that has profound implications for economic policy and for many other, for many other things. So I'm very happy to give the Hayek lecture. The question that I address in this paper and one I've addressed in, in, over my career, really one that's puzzled me, uh, like many people of my demographic, which is to say Jews, um, I started off as a, uh, as Walter said, started Walter Block in the last session said, started off as a, not quite a socialist, but pretty close, a non-believer in markets, and Early in my career in, in undergraduate school and then in graduate school, I became a free market person. And then like many converts, I asked myself the question, how could I have believed that stuff before? And why do many other people still believe it? And that's the issue that I'm, uh, I'm addressing today, the fact that there are, as we, as we know, huge numbers of people who don't believe in markets. It's a puzzle to everyone in this room because we all know that markets generate huge incomes and longer lives and happier people, and yet we have the Pope uh, out there uh, preaching against markets. We had a recent election where um, Bernie Sanders and, and uh, Mr. Trump, neither one of them were strong pro-market candidates, obviously, although Mr. Trump has actually turned out to be uh, more of a market guy than we might have hoped. I'm actually fairly optimistic about some of his, some of his policies. Um, but as a candidate, he was certainly not a pro-market guy, nor was Bernie Sanders, and yet they won, they won the election. Um, uh, Brian Kaplan's book, some of you may know, The Myth of the Rational Voter, has a whole section on what he calls anti-market bias, very common among people. Um, and of course, there are many socialist governments that are elected the government in Venezuela, which is destroying the country, uh, 
was, a, was an elected government, has been for some years. There's attempts to throw it out, but originally it was an elected socialist, socialist or communist government. I lived for a while in New York where we elected a uh, mayor who was originally a Sandinista, um, also not a pro-market guy in, in, in a city full of smart smart people. So there, and, and, you know, I, I don't need to convince people here that there's strong pro-market bias, what I call emporophobia, fear of markets, um, exists, exists everywhere. And it's a puzzle because markets do work so well. And we know that markets do work well. So my, my talk is organized in four parts. Um, first, I'm going to talk about people's intuitive understanding or lack of understanding of economics. Uh, the second point I'm going to discuss is, is competition. And, I, and, and I'm going to make the point that I think we economists overemphasize competition in the economy. And um, I think that and I'm going to make the point that I think that we overemphasize the role of competition in our discussion of the economy. And finally, and then I'm going to talk about a, a new concept in psychology, but one I think should be much more applied in economics called pathological altruism. And finally, I'm going to talk about the morality of the marketplace, how moral is the, is the marketplace and, and, and why do, how do people perceive it. So the first point is th that I want to make is, is really Hayek's point that economics is not intuitive, that people are, are naturally born or early on in their lives develop what I call folk economics, a uh, set of beliefs about the economy that is not based on the way the economy really works. Why is that? Well, the, p the point is that people do not have any intuitive understanding of economics. I use the example of speech Everybody grows up knowing how to talk, right? A normal child in a normal environment will learn how to talk without any special effort on the part of his parents. But we don't all learn to read. We have to be taught to read. Reading is not a natural inborn ability. Understanding of economics is like reading. Uh, we have to be taught to understand economics. We're not born with an intuitive understanding of economics. We're born with a, an intuitive misunderstanding of economics, if you like, in certain predictable kinds of ways. Why? Well, our, our brains evolved in small groups, groups where there was some trade between individuals, maybe a little bit of group trade, but there was um, not much else in the way of, of a developed economy. There was very little technical change for thousands and tens of thousands of years. People were born in the same, died in the same environment in which they were born. Some of the anthropologists talk about rapid technological changes happening over a several thousand year period. So there was no Stone Axe 1 followed six months later by Stone Axe 2, right? Stone Axe 2 was several thousand years after Stone Axe 1. Um, there was very little capital because people moved around a lot and you couldn't have a lot of capital when people moved around a lot. There was very little specialization. Adam Smith's specialization is limited by the extent of the market, applied even then. So if you had a group of 50 people and there was a really good stone axe maker, he would only make axes a few days a year because that was the only demand for his product and he would have to do other things the, the rest of the year. Um, and, and there was conflict. The people don't like to talk about it. They like to think of the noble, peaceful savage. But in fact, conflict is a very important part of human history and prehistory. Uh, and the groups next door, you had to always watch out for them because they were, maybe you would trade with them, maybe you would trade wives with them, but maybe they would attack you in your sleep and kill you. So there was, there was always conflict. And Anthropologists who don't like to think about it, they like to think that the world was always peaceful until capitalism came along. Nonetheless, they, many of them realize that, in fact, uh, we're, we're just a nasty species and we need to be tamed. Um, there was some exchange. There was a little bit of exchange. Uh, for example, if I had a good hunt this week, I might give you some of the meat in the expectation that you would have a good hunt next week. Um, or 
uh, maybe I am a good stone axe maker, so I would trade you an axe for uh, a, a rabbit or a fox or something of the sort. So there was some exchange, but there wasn't all that much exchange. Nonetheless, we do have, and, and, and people have documented this, we do have in our heads a pretty good cheater detection mechanism. So we're pretty good at detecting people who are cheating on a social agreement. For example, I might have a bad hunt, and you might give me some meat, but if I have a bad hunt week after week after week, you might figure out that I'm actually not doing much hunting at all. I'm out there sleeping under a tree, and you would view me as a cheater and begin not to share your, uh, share your food with me. That, that, that mechanism still survives, of course, but we do have a strong cheater detection mechanism, but that's more of an exchange mechanism than it is an understanding of economics mechanism. Um, so, so that was the world in which our brains evolved, and they did not evolve to consider trade with China uh, or millions. Of, they didn't evolve to consider societies of uh, 300 million people. Um, and, and, and many of these things we've learned, but we have to learn them. They're not natural. And economics is one of the things that we have to, uh, have to learn. So one of the major uh, implications of the way our brains evolved is that much of our thinking is zero sum. Uh, we, we think in terms of zero sum. We think in terms of uh, equal exchanges. And it's not just that our brains evolved that way. It's also true that we can understand much of the world that way. I use the analogy of flat earth thinking. For most of the decisions we make, most of the time, we can think of the earth as being flat, right? Unless you're a jet pilot uh, flying great circles around the earth. But if you're just a person living in the world, you can think the earth is flat and not much will happen to you. Nothing will happen to you. You can use your GPS or your maps and get around. And uh, there's no cost to being a believer in a flat earth, because most decisions can be made on the basis of a flat earth. Same thing is true of zero-sum thinking. Many, many times, most of what goes on can be, you can think of it as zero-sum. Uh, Susie gets the cookie, John doesn't get the cookie. Or I get the job, you don't get the job. Or uh, if we spend more on guns, we spend less on butter. Because in, in the short run, many resources are fixed, and the, in the short run, the world is zero sum. And again, for many, many of the decisions that we can make, that we make in our day-to-day -day lives, we don't go far wrong if we, if we use zero sum thinking, which is our evolved mechanism of thinking anyway. Um, populism is pretty much zero sum thinking. It's just, you know, more jobs for me, less jobs for you. Uh, Trump, is, when he was running, was running as pretty much a populist and pretty much a zero-sum sort of guy. We've got to get rid of immigrants, so there'll be more jobs for the rest of us. We have to stop trading with China so we can make more stuff ourselves. Wrong, but natural thinking. And part of the reason he did well is that it's, and, and Sanders was not much different. He had a different sort of zero-sum thinking, but again, not much different. Um, and so, so we have this module in our brains. And Marxism, uh, pop, very popular for a long time, still popular among our, prem, our colleagues who are economists on campus, is a natural outgrowth of zero-sum thinking. From each according to his ability to each according to his needs, assumes that the pie is fixed, right? We don't, does, the incentives don't matter, the pie is fixed. We can distribute it however we want. The labor theory of value, goes back to our history of, as, as a species with very little capital. And so what was created, lo and behold, labor created things. We had, say, an ax, maybe a hut, but not too much in the way of capital goods. So we could think that labor was the way that things were created. Um, so, so the popularity of Marxism as a, Marx simply uh, wrote down a system that was close to consistent with our evolved way of thinking about the world, and you know, he, he thought he was being scientific, but he was really being pre-scientific. He was really uh, giving, giving a voice to folk economics, giving a voice to the kind of e economics that we have if we're not trained in economics, which is what folk economics is. And um, because it was so consistent with the way people 
believed and with their evolved preferences, it's been very popular, it's intuitively very popular, but um, of course we all know it's, it's, it's wrong. We know that both uh, from our theories we know it's wrong and from the greatest social science experiment ever conducted leading to the collapse of the Soviet Union, we know that Marxism is not a, uh, doesn't work and yet people still believe it and part of the reason they believe it is because it is so, so intuitively plausible. So what are some implications? Well, if we believe in a flat earth, it doesn't matter, right? Unless we're a jet pilot, it doesn't matter if we believe in a flat earth. We can live our lives that way. But if we believe in zero-sum thinking, it does matter, not because it affects our day-to-day -day lives, but because um, we live in a democracy where uh, preferences of voters or beliefs of voters influence politicians. It's not clear whether people who believe the same way that we, that, that who, people who believe in folk economics become politicians or people who want to become politicians must act as if they believed in folk economics. Mr. Trump seems to be maybe of the second sort. He, he acted as if he was a folk economist, but maybe now he's not. Um, but at any rate, because we live in a democracy, folk, e folk economics, the belief, the economic beliefs of citizens is very important because citizens will vote for politicians who will then adopt policies based on folk economics. What are some other implications? Well, incentives don't matter much. If things are fixed, incentives don't matter. Uh, you know, you can, raise wa you can raise minimum wages, for example, with no effect because the number of poor workers is fixed. Uh, or go back to from each according to his ability. You can tax, tax people. The amount they produce is fixed. Um, if you think about income inequality, which was a big deal a few years ago, if incomes are fixed, if national GDP is fixed, and some people are rich, then other people must be poor because, again, GDP is a fixed, a fixed pie. That's an implication of zero-sum thinking, of folk economics. Um, prices. Prices serve to allocate things that are already existing. They don't serve to, uh, to create new things. So if there's a hurricane, we should set, fix the price of goods because they're fixed and, and there's no effect of fixing the price. Um, you know, the number, the amount of, of snow shovels, or not snow shovels, uh, shovels or ladders is given. There's no, no sense letting people increase the price. That's just price gouging. The supply is fixed. And more generally, uh, price controls, uh, we, we've gotten away from them in the U.S., fortunately, but at different times they've been very popular. And part of the reason they're popular is people don't understand the incentive effects of price controls. They think of prices as allocating a fixed amount rather than of prices as um, leading to more or less production of, of particular goods, obviously. Um, Imports, again, imports cost jobs. In a, in a zero-sum world, the amount to be consumed is fixed. If there's imports, there's less jobs for people. Uh, it's also true that, that when we talk about imports, it also brings in another module. As I said, there was a lot of conflict between people in the, in the, envir environment, in the evolutionary stage. So not only are we taking away our jobs, we're giving them to those guys, and those guys are, may well be our enemies. And we don't like them because they're not us. Uh, and so that's a second reason why tariffs and other impediments to trade can be very, very popular politically, because again, they fit with two parts of the, the evolved folk economic module that, uh, that people, are, people are carrying around in their heads. Um, immigration, same kind of thing. Taxes, we, we, when we talk about when, when not we, we economists, not us, but when others talk about taxes, tax reform, the issue is, are the rich paying more or the poor paying more? How can we make taxes fairer? Uh, there's very little popular discussion of the effect of taxes on incentives, that if we make taxes lower, people will produce more. Sometimes comes into the debate, but it's not the natural part of people's thinking about it. People's natural thinking is, Taxes allocated. The government has a budget. We have to fund that budget. Let's do it fairly. And again, things are more or less viewed as fixed. Uh, now, as I said at the beginning, we can learn differently. You know, we're, we're smart. Humans are smart, 
and we can learn that all of these things are not true. Everyone in this room has learned that all of these things are not true, and we can try to teach it to our students. Um, but it has to be taught. It's not something that people who are not taught are going to, uh, going to understand. We saw, again, in the recent election, uh, millions of, of uh, undergraduates were rallying around Bernie Sanders. They simply did not understand really any of the things that I'm saying now, um, you know, because he was sort of going in the opposite direction, and yet they believed him. They believed that his policies would have been better than, uh, than a set of pro-market policies. So it's not that, it's not that we're stuck on these, these false beliefs, but we have to be taught not to have them. I think in, in, in teaching economics, I think we really start one step too far forward. I think economics principles books, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, would do better if they started one step back. If they started with telling students, the world is not zero sum. There are real gains from trade. Things can get, you know, we get to gains from trade if we're lucky in the last chapter, uh, just before the final when we do international trade. But um, I think if we started one step farther back, I think it would really help us because I think students come to class with a zero sum mindset and we don't always address that mindset as, as, as carefully as we should. But all of these policies, all of these beliefs can be harmful because they lead to people supporting policies that are harmful. I think economists are partly to blame for this. Um, and because, because of the language that we use, this is where the how do we talk about economics comes in. I think we emphasize competition way too much in our, our analysis of the economy. I did a study, at, when I say I, of course, that means a graduate student, um, <laughs> did, a, did, a, did a study of uh, common textbooks, and we found that competition is mentioned eight times as often as cooperation in the textbooks. And it's a little worse than that, because often when cooperation is mentioned, it's in terms of oligopolists colluding. Uh, so co co cooperation is mostly ignored, and when it's not, it becomes a bad thing. Um, so, so competition is stressed. Um, Adam Smith, of course, talked about competition, but he also talked about the pin factory, which is cooperation. Uh, the, the, the analogy of competition comes from sports. If you read Stigler's famous paper on the history of, of the term, it turns out that the, the analogy comes from sports. Uh, competition is a term from sports. In sports, there are winners and losers. Um, sports are zero sum. And so when we talk about the competitive economy, we remember we start off with a, a zero sum mindset about the world then economists come and talk about competitive economy, and people say, aha, there's winners and losers in the economy. Um, they're competing dog-eat-dog. -dog. Uh, capitalism is an evil system because it's forcing people to compete and creating winners and losers. So the emphasis on competition reinforces our zero-sum thinking that comes from our folk economic, from our folk economic beliefs. Of course, there is competition. I, I don't want to downplay the role of competition. Competition is very important in an economy. Um, but what is, what is competition? What are firms competing for? They're competing for the right to cooperate. They're competing for the right to sell you stuff, and selling you stuff is a cooperative act. A transaction, the fundamental unit of economics, is a cooperative act. And so when people are competing, they are competing for the right to cooperate. So when Amazon and Walmart compete, what they're competing for is the right to cooperate with, with other people. Uh, they're not competing to put each other out of business, although that may be a byproduct, but what they're competing for really is the right to cooperate. What, what function does competition have? Competition chooses the best cooperators. So whoever wins in the competitive race, that's another way of saying that that party is the best cooperator. They won because they do the best job of cooperating um, rather than 
because they're the best. They're the best competitor, but they're the but the purpose of the, being the best competitor is to cooperate with. If you're if you're buying, it's to cooperate with sellers. If you're selling, it's to cooperate with with buyers. In a way, it's strange that economists do emphasize competition to the extent that we do, um, for a few reasons. First of all, go back to our model of pure competition, the one that we love. No competition in pure competition, right? The essence of pure competition is every seller ignores every other seller because all sellers are so small that none of them can affect the market. No competition. There is, there is, you know, we talk about the competitive model, and yet in the competitive model, there is no competition. The only assumption is that people, people are free to tra uh, fr trade with each other, and trade is, as I said, a cooperative act. Um, so, so we call our model pure competition, and it confuses lay people because when they think of competition, they think of Ford and General Motors and Toyota, but, but, but in our model of competition, there's none of those guys. They're only little guys who are trading trading small amounts and, and ignoring each other. So it's in a way strange that we call the model the, our model pure competition because it is not competitive. Um, Competition itself is, is not the goal of an economy either. As I said, competition is to sort out the best cooperator, but what's the goal of an economy? Well, the extent that the economy can said to have a goal, its goal is to maximize consumer surplus. Where does that come from? That comes from buying and selling or from exchange. Uh, that's, where, that's where consumer surplus comes from. Competition, again, is good because it enables us to sort out the best cooperators, the best people to buy and sell from, but um, it, doesn't, it, it isn't essentially the goal. It's a tool to make the cooperative economy work better. It's not the goal of the economy itself. Moreover, competition is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Uh, a market economy is not sept does not distinguish itself from a traditional economy or a Marxist economy by the fact there's competition. There's always competition. Humans are competitive. Uh, Darwinian, Dar Dar Darwinism tells us that, and there's always some sort of competition. So there's not, it's not that uh, market economies are unique by having competition. It's, they're just an example of every economy. So when you say this is a competitive economy, the Russian economy was also competitive. People were competing for different things in different ways, but they were competing just as we're competing in our economy. If you look at the discipline of marketing, marketing actually does a pretty good job. Uh, you know, economists were snobs, we don't like to think about marketing, but marketing actually does a better job of describing the cooperation between buyers and sellers and the goal of sellers in finding out how they can best cooperate with buyers. <laughs> so marketing actually does, does a pretty good job of looking at that. Moreover, uh, cooperation is, I claim, much more important, important than competition in an economy. The basic unit of, 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 of economics is a transaction. Transaction is a cooperative act. Uh, both buyers and sellers gain from cooperation. They must agree to cooperate or there's no transaction and they must both expect to gain or again, they will not transact with each other. Moreover, competition, co cooperation is vastly more common than is competition. Uh, think of yourself as an economist. Um, you, you compete when you're in the job market your first time. You're competing with a dozen, maybe two dozen other economists. Uh, as you go through your career, you're competing for maybe better jobs, maybe prizes, the Nobel Prize, the Clark Award. Um, you're competing for space in journals. But in all those cases, you're competing with a relatively small subset of people. And in fact, you're cooperating with all other economists. How are you cooperating with them? Well, you couldn't do your work if other economists hadn't done their work. Starting with Adam Smith, maybe. You could not uh, write papers if there were not things to say. And in fact, the, the, the current measure of the productivity of a scholar is citations, and a citation is essentially a measure of, of cooperation. 
When you cite someone's paper, you are cooperating with that person. You are using the information that they provided in order to advance your own particular argument. So um, a citation is an example of cooperation, but more generally, all economists are cooperating, cooperating to generate the, the literature, the knowledge that we have of economics. And of course, once you take an economist outside of the role of, 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 of as an economist, we're cooperating with everybody. We go to the store, we cooperate with merchants, we cooperate, every product we buy is a huge wave of cooperation. Um, so, so in economics, and, and, and we have theories of cooperation, specialization, gains from trade, division of labor, uh, they say going back to the pin factory, all of these are specific examples of cooperation, but um, it's my claim that we have not emphasized those enough in our research and in our talking, and that we have overemphasized the role of competition, which brings us back to our zero-sum way of thinking, rather than realizing that the economy is cooperative. Um, in a sense, you can think of the markets, markets as creating huge waves of competition uh, I'm sorry, huge waves of cooperation. We're, co you know, we're cooperating with people all over the world, people who are dead, who produce things that we use. We're cooperating with people who aren't born yet, who will use things that we produce. Um, so so you can, the economy, in my view, is the largest engine of cooperation that has ever been conceived. I won't say invented because no one invented it, but the largest engine of cooperation that has ever occurred in the history of the world, and it's it's very it's hugely cooperative, and yet we call it competitive, and I think we are losing something by doing that. I want to be careful when I say cooperation. I don't want you to think of me as some sort of soft new age guy. Oh, let's all love each other. Um, <laughs> you, you can be as as hard edged as you want. Uh, I like the example of of of, of Scrooge from. Uh, Charles Dickens' anti-market screed, A Christmas Carol. Um, Scrooge was the meanest guy in markets ever described. What did he do that was so mean? He lent money to people, right? Every act that he did, lending money, in fact, was a cooperative act. And by being Scrooge-like, by lending on harsh terms, he was able to lend money to people who needed it the most. Uh, later he became soft and we don't care about him, but at the beginning, um, <laughs> at the beginning, he was a very sound economic man. He was, you know, the caricature, and yet he was very cooperative. And the reason your rational, selfish economic person, uh, we can make a man, women, we know, or, or kinder, but your rational, selfish economic man is, uh, is, is cooperative is not because he's kind and good, it's because we must cooperate in order to maximize our own utility. Uh, we compete as well, but cooperation is a very important part of what we do. So what are the implications? Again, as I've said, uh, emphasis on competition reinforces zero-sum thinking. It reinforces the thinking that there are winners and losers. Um, sports, poker, those are games of competition. Politics is pretty much competition, although there's coalitions formed in, in politics, but an election is one winner and one loser. Those are competition. Um, and people tend to think mostly as competition as bad. Economists don't, we like competition. But most people think a, a co competition, is, except in sports, is a bad thing because they think, well, there's winners and losers in competition. If there's losers, they suffer, they're harmed, they feel sorry for them. Um, if, if, on the other hand, cooperation is win-win. Both parties can win from cooperation. So my, my point is that by emphasizing competition, economists are enforcing or reinforcing this zero-sum or win-lose way of thinking, and it meets, makes people think less well of the capitalist or of the market economy when they think of it as an economy of winners and losers. I like to use the example of Walmart. So Walmart moves to town and a bunch of mom and pop stores go out of business. What happened? 
Well, there are two ways of describing what happened. The conventional way is to say Walmart outcompeted them and drove them out of business, and all the mom and pop stores lost, and Walmart won. Isn't that a shame? Walmart's big and they're little, and yet Walmart outcompeted them and drove them out of business. The other metaphor is to say Walmart outcooperated them. Walmart offered goods and services to people at better prices and terms than the mom and pop stores. They did a better job of cooperating with their customers, and that's why the other stores went out of business. We can tell either story, they're both true, um, but one story has a very different psychological connotation than the other. The cooperative story focuses on what Walmart did right, the competitive story focuses on what Walmart did, did wrong. Um, and I think economists, not only in our, in our uh, teaching, but in our writing, when we write op-eds or when we write, we're, we're, we're called by the news to comment on something, I think if we keep this cooperative notion in mind, we can do a better job of convincing people that markets are good rather than uh, having them go away with the idea that markets are not good. Um, income inequality, again, you can say, well, poor people are outcompeted in the marketplace and that's why they're poor, or you can say poor people don't have much to sell and they can't cooperate very well because they don't have much to sell, um, and let's help them figure out a better way to cooperate um, than otherwise. What's a successful firm? The successful firm is the best cooperator, not the best competitor. Um, of course, special interest firms, special interests sometimes reinforce that competitive way of thinking. If you're uh, an import competing firm and you want a tariff, you will stress the competitive nature of international trade. And it's easy to do, again, because people tend to believe that way. Um, I, I have some, enough time left. I want to talk a little bit about what I call what's called pathological altruism which is a notion that the psychologists have just invented, but I think economists should make much more use of it. Um, pathological altruist is a person who serially engages in what it tends to be altruistic, but actually harms the person they're trying to help. A um, couple of examples that the psychologists give, when, when you see someone else is sad and you think it's your fault, then you can, then that's maybe pathological altruism. Um, inequality, again, can, feeling sorry for the poor can be an example of pathological altruism. Um, and, and many kinds of regulation are exactly that, a minimum wage. Uh, if, again, you can think of it as confusion. If you, you think that people are poor because they're outcompeted, then you try to change the terms of competition, minimum wage. If you think people are poor because they don't have opportunities to cooperate, then you want to increase their opportunities to cooperate, and a minimum wage reduces their opportunities to cooperate, takes away possibilities that they might have. So to the extent that we diagnose social problems as due to excessive competition, when they're really due to failures of cooperation, then we can end up making, making things worse because we're, we're viewing them through a competitive lens rather than a cooperative lens. Um, some examples, uh, minimum wage, tariffs, price controls. Uh, Bruce Yandel has talked about bootleggers and Baptists, a coalition between bootleggers who want to sell, want to sell illegal liquor on Sundays and Baptists who want people not to drink on Sundays, and they form a coalition to prevent the sale of liquor on Sundays. Um, there are many, many examples of that, of where an interest group will coerce someone into supporting their position, uh, and in fact, the person who's supporting it is often hurting the very people that it wants to help, uh, environmentalists and solar power firms, drug companies and safety advocates say, let's not import drugs from Canada. Uh, the European, uh, discussion of frankenfoods, foods that are created by uh, genetic manipulation. The Europeans weren't very good at it, the Americans were, and so the European food producers convinced the European consumers that these were bad, they were frankenfoods, they should be banned from Europe. Um, 
you know, safety advocates and food producers performing a uh, pathologically altruistic act together. <coughs> Finally, this, is this has implications for how we view the market. If we think of the market as competitive, then we think that it's, it's harmful, people are doing bad things. Um, some people say, well, markets, you know, they have their, their downside, they're really bad things, but they produce goods and services, so we have to tolerate them because they do these good things, even though they're a fundamentally immoral force. If we think of the market as cooperative, then we don't need to think that way. Then we can think, well, the market is cooperative, it's a good way to do things, and it's doing, it's doing good things. We don't have to apologize because the market itself is cooperative and it is producing goods and services. People that succeed in the market, it's not that they're the most ruthless, most ruthless competitors. People that succeed in the market succeed because they are doing the very best job of cooperating with others and we don't have to worry about them. There's a whole notion now of giving back uh, that strikes me as perverted. Um, Bill Gates produced huge amounts of wealth by producing Microsoft. He's choosing to give some of that wealth away, and that's fine, but it's not that he's giving back because he did bad things by producing Microsoft. By, by creating Microsoft, he did a really good thing, and you know, if he chooses to give away his wealth, that's fine, but he doesn't have to give back because he hasn't done anything wrong in the first place. He's done something very, very useful. He's been a hugely beneficial and efficient cooperator in the marketplace. So um, if, we think of, if we think of the market as being cooperative rather than as being competitive, uh, then we have a whole different view of the market. And I think if we economists could, could change our, our, our terms of discourse a bit and emphasize the cooperative nature of markets, I think we could do something to reduce the dislike of markets that we, that we observe. Uh, I, this is based on some papers I've written over the years, and as I say, it's in the process of becoming a book. Uh, I'll take questions, I guess. I still have time for questions.